Hi, my name is Tom. Welcome back to my channel and to another episode of What The Theory, my ongoing series in which I aim to provide some accessible introductions to key theories in cultural studies and the wider humanities. Today, we're going to be taking a look at Roland Barthes' seminal 1967 essay, The Death of the Author, and we'll be considering its implications for how we read, whether that involves actually reading or watching, listening, uh, playing, cultural texts, and how we interpret them. As always, if you have any questions, suggestions as we go along, then please do feel free to pop those below. And if you're new around here and this seems like your kind of thing, then please do consider subscribing and hitting that notifications button. For now, however, let's crack on with the death of the author, what the theory. <laughs> The Death of the Author is a 1967 essay by the massively influential cultural and literary theorist Roland Barthes. It is incredibly short, just seven pages long in the version reproduced in Barthes' anthology Image Music Text. Yet, despite this short length, it has gained quite the reputation. A great deal of that notoriety, I would argue, stems from that very provocative title, where other texts or treatises may tend towards language which is either highly technical or obscure. There's something undoubtedly appealing about the pronouncement of the death of the author. Nevertheless, beneath that murderous title lies a far more measured piece of writing, and the use that we can find from Roland Barthes' ideas here lie as much in its theoretical incisiveness and precision as in the strength of the language. Today then, as well as introducing some of the key ideas from Barthes' essay, I also want to try and look beyond that title in order to draw out some of the subtler elements of Barthes' argument. In a similar mode, one of the reasons the death of the author is so often referred to in the present day is because it marks a seminal moment in the development of what we now call theory. It is often considered the moment where literary scholars abandoned approaches which we might group together as structuralism and embraced post-structuralism. As we go along today, however, what I would like to do is slightly refute this popular notion that the death of the author represents some massive violent break from all previous scholars scholarship. Because rather than some kind of manifesto in the door moment, I think we can more accurately frame it as a sort of subtle bridge from one school of thought to another. So to frame today's video not entirely in sort of Marxist terminology, today's video is about viewing the death of the author as reform rather than as revolution. But first, some context. Of all the theoretical approaches to analysing literature and culture flying round in the 1960s, and there were a lot of them, the most dominant ones can be grouped together as what we refer to as structuralism. To summarise very briefly and in very broad strokes, structuralism seeks to consider how the meaning that we derive from individual cultural texts might be reliant upon much wider cultural codes and ideas. The notion of genre, for example, is a highly structuralist one. It asks us to consider how different cultural texts might be grouped together and how they might draw upon similar narrative ideas, tropes, devices, character traits, etc. A structuralist analysis of a comedy, for example, might seek to consider how the meaning that we derive from that comedy, including the laughter, might not only be reliant upon elements within that text itself, but also upon our wider knowledge of comedy as a form. Roland Barthes himself had been a key proponent of such approaches, and his book Mythologies is full of numerous engaging and really insightful examples of a structuralist approach to cultural analysis. Where many previous schools of thought had focused on the analysis of cultural text as individual self-contained objects then, structuralism invited scholars to take a step back and to consider the wider wider cultural codes and meaningful systems of which that cultural text was a part. And against this theoretical backdrop, Bart found himself asking whether if the meaning that we derive from any individual cultural text is so reliant upon wider cultural codes and sign systems, 
we should really give that much credit to any individual author at all. So, in The Death of the Author, Bart seeks to critique the significance that we so often instinctively find ourselves ascribing to an individual author of an individual cultural text, and he does so from multiple angles. However, to bring out the sort of subtleties of Bart's argument, I really want to start today by focusing on how he develops this notion of the importance of cultural context. Bart writes that a text is not a line of words releasing a single theological meaning, the message of the author God, but a multidimensional space in which a variety of writings, none of them original, blend and clash. He continues that the author's only power is to mix writings, that in a thing he thinks to translate is itself only a ready-formed dictionary, its words only explainable through other words. Here, Bart is forwarding an argument that we might have often heard, that no cultural text can ever truly be original, that any cultural text will draw upon narrative devices, character traits, jokes, etc. from pre-existing books, films, television shows, performances. Yet what Bart is using this idea to do is to suggest that we might more accurately consider an author not as some kind of divine creator of meaning from nothingness, but instead as a sort of collage maker, piecing together pre-existing ideas in a unique and original way. Indeed, Bart argues that the celebration of the author as some kind of divine creator is in fact very specific to the modern West and a result of the European Protestant Reformation's privileging of the individual. He points out that in what he slightly problematically refers to as ethnographic societies, the responsibility for a narrative is never assumed by a person, but by a mediator, shaman or relator whose performance, the mastery of the narrative code, may possibly be admired, but never his genius. In short, in such society, someone might be celebrated for their articulation of a story, but no one's ever particularly interested in whether they created the meanings present within that or not. If we look to the ancient Greeks, we can see a very similar disinterest in authorship as individual conception. Although each epic poet or tragedian who retold the story of Odysseus or Electra, Achilles or Medea, undoubtedly altered the meaning of those narratives, the fact that they were very clearly writing into a tradition of pre-existing versions of that same narrative meant that few would have been interested in what, if anything, they had created themselves. Certainly, texts within our contemporary culture do far more to hide their influences than those of the Greeks, and very much seek to present themselves as original. Yet, Bar argues that the process is still very much the same, Again, that the act of authorship is more a one of assembling different influences rather than some kind of magical process of creating something from nothing. Bart therefore argues that we might more accurately refer to the creator of a literary text not as an author, but as a scripter who no longer bears within him passions, humours, feelings, impressions, but rather this immense dictionary from which he draws a writing that can know no halt. The book itself is only a tissue of signs. And it's important to note that in doing so, Bart is not seeking to attack the skill that the creation of a cultural text undoubtedly involves. He is simply asking us to reconsider how we think of that act. All this being said, the aspect of the death of the author which often receives the most attention is Bart's argument that when analysing any given cultural text, we should not be too preoccupied with what the author's intentions were. For although the case against what Wimsack Jr. and Beardsley had in 1946 called the intentional fallacy had been made numerous times, as Bart saw it, literature scholars were still far too preoccupied with uncovering an author's intentions in the meaning of a text. He bemoans that the explanation of a work is always sought in the man or woman who produced it, 
as if it were always in the end, through the more or less transparent allegory of the fiction, the voice of a single person, the author confiding in us. When taking such an approach, it is almost considered that the text itself is simply a flawed expression of a set of meanings which the author themselves holds onto. In this mode, then, the goal of any analysis is almost to look through the text to seek what meanings it is that the author is still clasping. Very often, this encouraged a biographical approach, and Bart foregrounds in particular the way in which analyses of Van Gogh's work had been restricted to solely considering how the sunflowers or Starry Night, for example, might be some kind of expression of the artist's psychosis. And this is clearly a limiting way to look at things. Because succumbing to such an approach relies upon two assumptions. The first is that it is possible to uncover what an artist's intention with a cultural text was. And the second is that that meaning is the objectively correct meaning of that text. And in the death of the author, Bart seeks to debunk both of these assumptions. In the very opening of the essay, Bart draws upon an extract from Balzac's Saracen in order to consider whether we can truly know who is speaking from a text, and thus what the author's intention ever was. To slightly update Bart's terms of reference, I want to draw upon Martin McDonough's 2017 film Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Throughout this film, Sam Rockwell's character, Dixon, frequently throws around racial epithets. But how should we interpret these? Is such language simply a character trait of Dixon's? Is the writer himself using the character to channel his own love of throwing around such terms? Or is it part of a broader attempt to explore racism in contemporary America? In truth, Bart argues, we can never be truly certain. Of course, the difference is that Balzac had been dead for over a century at Bart's time of writing, and Martin McDonough is very much alive. However, even if we asked him what his intention with the character of Dixon was, we could never truly be sure that he was telling the truth. And indeed, much of the conversation surrounding J.K. Rowling's frequent returns to her Harry Potter series to kind of add intention there has revolved around the fact that many of the fans of her work seem to think that maybe she's not being entirely genuine. Thus, while contrary to popular belief, Bart does not suggest that trying to work out what an author's intention with a text was is never an interesting pursuit, he does argue fairly strongly that to arrive at a definitive conclusion is near impossible. He does not end on such a fatalistic note, however. Instead, he draws upon the impossibility of deriving an author's intention to suggest that maybe a cultural text does not have an objective meaning at all. For just as the author brings all those uh, pre-existing texts they've seen, all those cultural codes, and all those pre-existing influences to the table when they create a text, so does the reader bring a similar amount of baggage to the table when they read it. This means that the meaning that any given reader will derive from a text will be different to that of any other. My reading will be different to yours. Bart writes that a text is made up of multiple writings, drawn from many cultures and entering into mutual relations of dialogue, parody, contestation. But there is one place where this multiplicity is focused, and that place is the reader, not, as was hitherto said, the author. The reader is the space on which all the quotations that make up a writing are inscribed. In this way, Bart argues that the process of signification through which meaning is communicated is only truly completed when a text is read, and as such that any given reader will have a different reading of it, and thus that any text has multiple meanings. Yet he does not see this as a downfall or a defeat of literary analysis. Instead, he sees it as a truly freeing notion. 
in which the emphasis is shifted away from the writing and creation of texts and towards the experience of the reader. To paraphrase Barthes' final sentence here, the most important part of this essay is not so much the death of the author, but instead the birth of the reader. For while many of the ideas within the death of the author draw upon ideas and extend ideas from structuralism, it is in pronouncing the birth of the reader that Bart really lays the foundations for post-structuralism to begin. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it has been useful and interesting in some small way. As ever, if you think this might be a vague net positive for the world, then I would very much appreciate a thumbs up down below. And uh, if you haven't already, then please do consider subscribing. Thank you very much for watching once again and have a great week.